there are four kinds of right effort, four ways in which the strength of persistence gets developed, preventing unskillful qualities from arising, abandoning any unskillful qualities that have arisen, giving rise to skillful qualities that are not there yet, and once they're there, then trying to develop them further. Sometimes we get stuck in a snag. We've been doing one kind of right effort, like we're trying to develop concentration, and it goes for a while, and then something happens. That's when you want to look around and see what other kinds of effort you might be exerting. An important one is preventing unskillful things from arising. That's what restraint is all about, restraint of the senses. You really have to be careful about what you take in. This is where our devices are our main enemy, because they make us accessible to all kinds of things. It's so easy to pick them up, look at a headline, look at a website, and then the mind can go running for days. So you have to be careful about what you take in, because it can destroy good states of concentration. Remember, concentration is something put together, it's fabricated, and its nature is to slip away. So we have to be constantly shoring it up, protecting it, have a sense of its value. And John Lee's images of a dish of food, you want to keep it covered to make sure the flies don't come in. So when you look at something, ask yourself, who's doing the looking, and what's going to happen as a result of the looking? Same when, when you listen. Those are the two big ones. And of course, the third big one is what you're thinking about. It's so easy to let just a little bit of a sensual fantasy come into the mind. or irritation about somebody else, and it can turn into ill will. You've got to watch out for these things, because they come in they come in small, and then they grow. There's a type of voodoo that's said to be practiced in Thailand, where they take a, the skin of a water buffalo and they chant over it and sprinkle water on it, and it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And then they'll send it into somebody, and as soon as it gets into that other person, then it expands back to its original size, kills the person. That's a good image for these little things that come into the mind. And don't seem too much as they come in. And when they move in, then they expand. So watch out. Have a sense of the value of your concentration, that you want to protect it. And if you look in your dish of food, it seems to be there's no food there at all. Well, at least keep the cover on, so that when you do finally get some new food, you put it in there and it's safe and sound. In other words, even when the concentration is not going well, you want to protect your state of mind as much as you can. It's simply that when the mind is concentrated, you should actually be more sensitive to the little things that can set it off. You've got to be careful. So that's preventing. Then there's giving rise to. Sometimes it helps to think about the world for a bit. Not the world that you see in your device, but the world that the Buddha taught. There's this tendency to think that the Buddha's worldview was simply something he picked up from his surroundings here in India. But you look at the actual worldviews that are expounded in the Vedas and the Upanishads, and they're very different. The Buddha's insight of the night of his awakening really was an insight. All those many, many rebirths, and all those many levels of the cosmos in which beings could take rebirth. 
and the constant shuffle around. Like a deck of cards, you deal out a hand, then you take them back, and then you shuffle them again, and then you deal out another hand, totally different. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. And sometimes it's good just to think about it. this is what the cosmos is like. You've been wealthy many times. You've been a deva many times. You've been a hell being many times. John Munn said that he was able to remember one period when he was reborn as a dog 500 times consecutively. So because the mind got stuck there. Think about that. Just imagine 500 dogs, one by one by one. You've probably done that too. And you have been a deva, and you have been a meditator, and things went well for a while, but then they fell back again, and you gave up. And you can start thinking, do I want to give up again? Remember John Munn's statement that what keeps you going is that determination not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. Think about the defilements laughing at you. Do you want that? Again. So think about that image. This is what the world is like. The world of the, the media is just a surface show. Underneath it we have all these things going on, beings shifting around. And you think you can get to a secure place, but there are no really secure places anywhere in there. The canon tells of Baka the Brahma who'd been a Brahma, the king of his particular realm, for so long that he'd forgotten that he'd ever been anything else. So he assumed that this was it, this was who he was. He wasn't going to change. The Buddha had to go and show him that he was wrong by disappearing to a realm that Baka himself couldn't see, and pointing out that there was a different kind of consciousness that had nothing to do with any of the six senses at all. And the funny thing is the, the Sutta doesn't tell whether Baka changed his mind or not. But think about that. You can get to a really high place like that and think you're secure, and then you're going to fall. To say nothing of this human realm where everything is so precarious. So you think about the fact that you've got the opportunity to practice now, and that you can create some good karma for yourself. That's your mainstay. So what kind of good karma are you going to create? Well, work on the mind. We have that blessing every morning, Ayutwano Sukambalan. May you have a long life, beauty, happiness, strength. And the verse says that those who show respect to those worthy respect will have these four rewards. What does it mean to show respect? In the Buddhist case, he said you show respect by practicing. So as you practice, you're blessing yourself. This is how you create at least something that you can hold on to as you go through all those many, many realms. But then you realize that there's, there's got to be something safer. The Buddha saw the dangers in those realms, so he worked on what he could. Think in these ways and long enough and you settle down to saying that anything that would pull you away right now is not really worth it. It's all very ephemeral. It has no substance. The Buddha has a whole series of images, like a glob of foam on a river. You've probably seen them where some tree sap gets into a river and it gets stirred up a little bit and fills, fills with bubbles, so it's a glob of foam. And it gets carried along by the water. There's no substance there. The bubbles that form on a river is 
There's raindrops on it, a mirage, a, pan a plantain tree where you try to find the, the core and there's no core, a magic show. It's all very ephemeral. There's no substance there in any of these aggregates that we use to create our sense of who we are. And the Buddha said, you think about all the many lifetimes you've been through, and it's just aggregates. That's all it is. And here you are, sitting in your current pile. What are you going to do with them? You can make them into a path. In fact, you make them into a path willy-nilly anyhow, but you can make them into a really good path. We had the example of the Buddha and his noble disciples. Here again, it's good to use your imagination the right way. Think of them as ordinary people, because that's what they were when they began. And many of them had deeper problems than you do, and they were able to pull themselves together, gain awakening, and find true safety. So use your imagination to give rise to skillful qualities, to create the mind state that wants to practice and finds it easy to settle down. The formula for right mindfulness is focused on the body in and of itself, or feelings, or mind states, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And it's good to know to have a sense of which world you're living in. If you're living in the world of the media, there's so much that has to be done to fix this problem, fix that problem. Get upset about this politician, get upset about the other politician. But learn to see through that. Having that image of the world doesn't inspire you to practice, unless you look at it in the right way. And looking at it in the right way looks at means looking at it from the point of view of the Buddha's world, in which you see how things rise and fall, and social problems can be dealt with, but then people die, and then they die again, and then they die again. And what gets dealt with gets undealt with over and over and over again. And so when you look around you and there's nothing in the world that has any appeal, then it's a lot easier for the mind to settle down. So use your intelligence. Remember what intelligence is. It's the ability to see connections, but it's also the ability to be selective in what you respond to and how you respond. As I said the other day, restraint is a sign of intelligence, precisely for that reason. And the way you use your imagination also can either be intelligent or not intelligent. But remember that right view is not just brute effort. It's intelligent effort, using all your mental faculties. and its tools along the path.